Welcome back to the fourth week of this uh, NPTEL course on human molecular genetics. This week also happens to be the final week wherein we will be discussing uh, more recent developments in the area of human molecular genetics. What you have seen in the last first, second and third uh, week lectures is how uh, the genetic material is uh, you know sort of understood with regard to its contribution to human disorders. We looked into for example, the central dogma and how the information is processed in biological system. Then we moved on and understood the concept behind recessive and dominant characters and, and, and variations therein. And then we looked at the pedigrees and looking into phenotype that uh, segregate in the human population uh, to arrive at a conclusion whether the genes that is causing a particular uh, phenotype is a dominant or recessive in nature. And then we looked into some of the complications with regard to uh, the Mendelian segregation. Then we moved on and uh, looked into some of the molecular biology techniques people use in, in, in uh, characterizing what are the defects that are there in the gene and how that may contribute to the disease condition. Then we discussed some of the issues about model systems and how model systems are used to understand disease pathology to validate you know some of the uh, hypothesis and finally to use it for some therapeutic applications. So that has, uh, these are the topics that we covered so far and in this week we are going to look into uh, uh, you know the approach we use to identify the disease causing gene. So this is going to be a challenging uh, topic because it is going to have I really you know expect you to have the fundamentals clear otherwise it would be difficult for you to follow. So even if you are uh, having some difficulty in understanding this lecture I would encourage you to go back and uh, you know watch the um, you know week 2 and week 3 lectures and come back and uh, revise and, and then see whether you can understand. If you have any issues in understanding you can always uh, write to us and we will try to help you and of course we are going to have hangout sessions at the end of the course wherein I could also you know help you with uh, some of the concepts if you still are unable to understand some. So let us look into what is the topic that we are going to study <coughs> in this week. Uh, the, the, the title is from you know pedigree to defective genes. So we have looked into the pedigree analysis, we have looked into the gene structure and how defects cause uh, particular disease. But what you are going to see today is how uh, we use pedigree to identify the gene that causes the disease. So you know the disorder that we look into in the human population can be categorized into two groups uh, that have the genetic origin. One we call as a monogenic disorders because here the, the defect lies in one particular gene therefore you have the phenotype. The other group is polygenic disorders wherein the disease phenotype results from a combination of variations in more than one gene maybe 4, 5, 6 depending on what is the complexity. So the approach that we use to identify um, uh, the genes that contribute to the disease varies. If you are using a monogenic disorder to, uh, to identify a disease gene, we use a very different kind of approach. If it is a polygenic disorder, we use a very different approach. So what we are going to do is to cover these two along with some other advancements. Like for example, in the last two decades, uh, we have seen tremendous advancement in, in uh, advancements in molecular genetics, molecular biology. The human genome has been sequenced. Now we are trying to understand all the variations that are there in the human population. So we will, what we will do is that we will combine the approaches with how the advancement has really helped us to uh, arrive at different approaches, right? To uh, to to identify the genes. So that would be the focus of. Um, you know this week's lecture. Let us uh, look into the pedigree. So we will start with the pedigree. So this is something that we should be familiar with. Now looking at it you will be able to say this is a autosomal recessive inheritance and the phenotype is because of autosomal recessive conditions right. So we have seen all these things. The question that we are going to address today is what is the current method or how people really used uh, what approach they have used to identify the genes. So when you say autosomal recessive disease we are talking about a gene that is located in one of the 22 pairs of autosomes. So we are excluding X and Y 
because they show very different kind of inheritance. Now, that is all that you can do with the pedigree analysis. You have looked at the pedigree, you have you know you come up with a model which suggests it could be autosomal recessive. But now, it is going to be a daunting task as to which one of the you know 22 chromosome that you see in this slide harbors the gene right. So, that is going to be extremely you know difficult task to see. So, uh, it is going to be a daunting task to to come up with uh, kind of a valid uh, proof to say in which one of the 22 pairs of the autosome that we have the gene could be located. So, what we are going to discuss is some of the conventional ways people use to identify human disease genes. So, let us look into what are the ways people have identified at least in the past the disease genes. One of the initial you know uh, discoveries on genes that are causing human genetic disorders have come from uh, understanding the uh, knowing the functions of the gene or using functional assays. So, in other words you know a, a physiological pathway that is defective in a disorder and you know that disorder is uh, caused by some genetic defect because it runs in the family. So, now you use your understanding on the physiology to identify the gene that could possibly contribute to the disease. So, this is called as a functional cloning because you 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 identified the gene because of the known functions of the gene. So, that is why you have gone on to identify them. So, let us look into some of those uh, examples. One of the famous example is the bleeding disorder what you call is hemophilia that uh, that was uh, you know uh, discovered in the family of uh, Queen Victoria the, the, queen, the then queen of uh, the British kingdom. And this is one of those uh, rare photographs that you can find in the uh, in the website uh, about the family. This is a very happy family at least in the picture it looks so, but there are many unfortunate incidents in this family. So, as you can see here this is a kind of a pedigree that is shown and you have some individuals that are identified with the red color filled in symbols for male and female. These are the people who are affected with this uh, bleeding disorder. It has a very very severe condition because in this condition the blood will not clot as a result you know unless or otherwise you are very careful you are going to have extremely you know high volume of uh, blood being lost because of some uh, injury or cut or anything. So, you can see here that uh, the queen herself was not affected um, she was all right, but she is expected to be a carrier and it is uh, sort of perceived that uh, the, the mutant gene could have come from her father. <coughs> and you can see in her next generation um, one of her uh, sons uh, he was affected and uh, we know now that this particular disorder is caused by a gene that is located on the X chromosome. So, it is you know X linked uh, inheritance. So, let us look in how they are really identified. So, this is the kind of you know symbol that are shown, but let us uh, not worry about it. What is what has been understood is that by then people have understood the biochemical basis of how the blood clot happens. Okay. So, it is uh, known that we have a large number of factors proteins that are there in your blood and which uh, you know upon activation for example, when it uh, gets in contact with uh, the air oxygen or atmosphere because of an injury or whatever then it, it sets in a cascade which results in the blood clotting. So, there are many different factors that are listed here on the right side on the left side of the screen like you can see here. So, you can see that these are the factors that are involved in the blood clotting what you find in all of us who are very normal that you have all these you know uh, factors are very active. So, if you do a biochemical assay for these factors you will find that it is working. So, what they have done is very similar kind of approach they use to identify which particular factor could possibly be abnormal in, in this family you know those who have the hemophilia and they found was this particular factor at least in this family that factor was defective in these individuals you do not see factor uh, 8 being active. So, that is how they understood probably this is what is deficient it could be some genetic mutation that results in the deficiency of factor 8. So, with that understanding they went on to identify the gene. So, the, the, the approach that they used then was that they purified the factor from the blood. So, it is when you say factor it is a protein and then they sequence this protein to obtain what is called as amino acid sequence right. So, they have now the amino acid sequence for the protein and then they predicted what could be the coding sequence. So, you know what are the different codons for each amino acid 
and with that you can come up with multiple options as to what would be the coding sequence. And based on that sequence, they have designed DNA, uh, short stretch of DNA uh, using lab machines. Now, we have what is called as uh, DNA synthesizers, we can add those, this is a kind of a chemistry by which you will be able to add certain bases to get kind of sequence that you want. And they have designed this coding region. And then they went and screened what is called as a cDNA library. Remember we discussed about that, that we, we convert the messenger RNA into uh, a single stranded DNA and then to double stranded DNA. We clone them in the vectors and then they are stored and you can use any kind of a probe, what you call here for example, the DNA coding region for factor 8. You can use it as a probe and identify the cDNA that codes for this factor. That is how they cloned the gene. And then they went on to see what is the defect in that particular individual. So that is how you know they have done. So this approach that that led to the discovery of the gene is really, really you know time consuming, and and uh, and, and you have lots of challenges. You know there are very few such examples wherein people identified the protein product that is defective, and then went on to identify the the gene that codes for that protein. So there are challenges. Some of them are listed in the screen. Not all genes are characterized. In fact, we do not know all the genes that our human gene, uh, genome contains. And even if you know the gene, we do not know what is the function of the gene. So, you may know this is the protein that it codes for, that is all you can predict. But still, you do not know what is the function of this protein in the organism, for example. You may say it is an enzyme present in the cell, but how does it really you know, changes the individual, right? That is not known. So, the physiological functions of most of the genes are not known. And therefore, since you do not know the function of the gene uh, or the protein, you cannot you know come up with assays to test whether it is active or inactive, how mutations could have affected and so on. A protein could have multiple different functions and how are you going to come up with all sorts of assays. For example, you are talking about a mental retardation as a condition, right. So, wherein your intellectual ability is, uh, is not that good, your IQ is low. So, what kind of assays you will do? to understand how the gene defect affected your intellectual abilities. It is going to be extremely difficult. So, even designing assays for some of the genes of some of the phenotype that you are looking at are going to be extremely difficult. So, therefore, even predicting I mean these are the candidate genes therefore, I can uh, go and uh, identify mutation there is also is uh, you know difficult, but still there are some. Um, example, for example, uh, epilepsy, one of the conditions wherein people uh, get what you call as fits. You know, they thought that it could be resulting from abnormal neuronal function. Therefore, people thought it is the channels that uh, 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 regulate the uh, the uh, what you call as the neuronal function in terms of its membrane potential, how the electricity is passed on from one to the other. These are regulated by channels, and people thought the channel could be involved and they went ahead and sequenced many of the channels. There were some success, they were be able to find some mutations, but still it is extremely you know difficult um, approach to identify the genes based on the functions of the protein that you know. So, therefore, it is very, very the, the success has been very, very limited. The other approach people have used is to uh, look at animal models. You know, when you talk about disorders disorders are caused by defect in a gene. So, we have genes likewise every living species has got the genes and defect therein should also result in some abnormality. But more often uh, what we do is we breed, we domesticate animals, we breed them and we have selected for some good characters. If the character uh, that, that comes in a generation that are not desirable, more often that are not you know, selected by the human therefore, the gene gets lost. But still there are many conditions that you see, uh, wherein uh, you, know, you know there are animals that developed uh, some symptoms, some phenotype that resemble some human disorders. And when they have identified such, then they have located the gene for that using human, uh, human the sorry, using the mouse species or any other model that they have used. And once you know this is the gene that causes the phenotype in this animal, then you can go and look at the mutations in that equivalent gene in the human. So, this is also has been some of the approaches. I will show you one such examples wherein. So, this is a candidate approach people have used looking at the uh, function of the gene product. So, the other approach people have used to identify a gene based on structural changes in the chromosome. 
so you as we discussed the chromosomes you know at times there are um, uh, exchange between the chromosomes as a result you have rearrangements and the rearrangements are known to result in certain disorders right. So, therefore, if a given translocation and I, what I mean is that a part of the chromosome goes and attaches to some other chromosome you have a disease. If you are getting the same disease and the translocation is seen in many individuals because of recurrent events then you would assume that that the gene involved in the onset of the given disease is located very close to where the chromosome is broken right. So, that is the approach. So, they have used and there are many examples this is something I am showing that we discussed already that is the Philadelphia chromosome associating with a, a type of blood cancer is resulting from translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 and we know that the break point where the chromosome break happens here and here you know harbors genes ABL and BCR and because of the fusion you have a new uh, sequences and one gene gets activated normally should not be expressed and then you have the disease. So, now you know this is for example, C ABL or BCR is involved in you know in this particular cancer. So, this is another way by which you know by looking at chromosomal changes translocations people have are able to identify the disease causing genes right. So, again later they have understood what is the function. So, this is the one of the ways by which you can do. So, the third uh, you know approach people have used is to characterize animal models. There are you know animals that we use for studying genetics and many of these animals also have uh, you know very uh, genes that are very very similar to us. For example, if you look into the mammalian species whether it is a rat, mouse or any other model system that you study have got all the genes that we also have. Therefore, if there are some defect that we expect uh, to, to cause a genetic condition in humans it is likely that the same gene defect in the mouse or rat and rabbit should also be causing this similar phenotype that we have discussed already in the gene knockout uh, uh, you know lecture wherein you are able to create deletions create mutations in the gene that cause you know disorder in the human. So, you create similar mutations in the animal and then look at whether the animal develop and if it develops then you understand what is the pathology. But people also looked at animals which uh, somehow you know inherited a natural mutation as a result they have certain defect uh, and, and resulting in a phenotype and if the phenotype resembles some of the disorders that you see in humans then you know that you know the gene that is mutated in mouse is also likely to be mutated in the humans. So, you identify what is the gene that is defective in mouse and look at the corresponding gene in the human and see whether that has defect. There are some you know uh, uh, success stories there too. What I am showing is a condition called as Wardenberg syndrome and this particular syndrome is caused by a gene called SOX10. This is uh, a transcription factor. So, what is this disease? This is a congenital anomaly there are multiple developmental problems. One of the phenotype is also a, a, a something to do with uh, pigmentation whether the coloration. So, what you can see on the top is that this particular mouse you know this naturally developed a mutation resulting in many developmental abnormality as well as pigmentation you can see here in the forehead that the hair color is very very unique you do not have the coloration. And also the other condition is the distance between the eyes between the two eyes also is enlarged we have more flat face and then there are other problems there are number of problems. What is interesting is that a very similar phenotype has also been seen in human for example, you can see here the baby she has got premature grey you know in the grey hairs and then there are there are problems with eye and there are problem with uh, you know heart development there are many many different conditions. What is uh, you know uh, important to understand from this particular course point of view is that they identified they did the mapping for the mouse gene as to what is the gene that causes this phenotype in the mouse and they identified the gene called as SOX10 the, the, and then they looked at that there is a deletion that it causes and so on. Once they understood the gene then immediately what they did they did not do any mapping for the humans straight away they looked at whether SOX10 
is a gene that is mutated and indeed that was the case you know they went ahead and then shown that it is similar gene mutation similar phenotype in the humans as well. So, there are a handful of ex, you know examples wherein uh, animal models uh, which developed you know one or the other disease condition because of spontaneous natural mutation uh, led to the discovery of uh, genes that causes uh, the disease in the human as well. Again these are limited. The challenges we do not have animal models for all the disorders it is it is not possible because of reason that most of the model system that we use for our experimental purpose are, are inbred and maintained in the colony. Normally look at whether the animals are normal, they have a healthy phenotype, if not we remove them. Therefore, we know that whatever experiments we do, whatever effect you see is because of the experimental change, but not because of something you know not linked to the experiment that you do. Therefore, you normally maintain very healthy you know animals in the lab settings therefore you will not find any natural mutations coming in rarely you see that and lab animals do not have variations or mutation like you know what you see in human all of us look different all of us you know behave different and all of us are exposed to very different kind of environment whereas lab animals are inbred meaning they have very very similar genetic makeup the variations is very very limited and then therefore you keep selecting for a you know the good phenotype therefore, you do not really allow them to sort of acquire in the population some abnormal uh, mutation or variation in the DNA. And even if there were mutations resulting in the phenotype in the lab animals, you know mapping them is going to be extremely difficult. It is more difficult than what you can do with humans because normally you do mapping based on the sequence variation that you have in the genome that is what we are going to discuss now. But you know the sequence variations if you you know look into the lab animals they are very very limited you know uh, that is what I, I was explaining that they are what is called the isogenic line meaning you minimize all the variations of the genetic level or the environmental level and only you look at changes you bring in because of your experimental condition and the phenotype that you see. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to use you know model animals to identify human geni genetic uh, um, or, or the defective genes for human disorders. So, what is the approach that was very successfully used to identify a majority of the genes that cause monogenic disorders. The, the approach that people used very successfully thousands of genes have been identified in the last you know two decades is called as positional cloning approach. Meaning you look at region of a chromosome that is associated with the disease without really bothering about what is a gene, what is the function, what is the pathophysiology. You only look at a region of chromosome that is likely to be contributing to the disease phenotype and then look at what are the genes that are there and then look at what variation there results in the disease condition. So, that is called as you know positional cloning approach and there are two different approach in the post uh, genomic era where we now know the human genome sequence the approach now you use is somewhat different as compared to the approaches that were used in the in when we are not knowing the human genome sequence. So, we will talk about you know the approaches that were used before the human genome sequence was understood and then how that is really not necessary now once you know the human genome sequence. So, that is what you are going to discuss. So, these are the different steps in identifying the defective gene using the approach what you call as positional cloning. We call it a conventional approach because this is the approach that was used before the uh, the human genome sequence was made available. So, what do you do? You define the candidate chromosomal region. You sort of say that this is the region of the chromosome, a particular chromosome that is uh, causing a particular disease likely. And then up time you know you get the genomic uh, uh, segments representing that chromosome and then look into just just block it here. So, let us look into the conventional ways to identify the human you know disease gene. So, what do you call as a positional cloning approach where in we identify a region of a chromosome that is associating with a particular disease then go on to identify the gene that are located in that region. So, what are the steps? So, the first step is you have to identify the candidate chromosomal region that is that is something that is shown here right. So, the, this is called as identify. So, identify the chromosomal region that is associating with the disease that is the very first step 
once you identify it, then you have to get you know DNA fragments representing that region of the chromosome. You go to the genomic DNA library and identify all the fragments that represent the region of the chromosome. And then, then you have to go and next look into genes that are located in that region where you thought uh, you know the defective gene could be present. And then based on some features like for example, whether the gene is expressed in the tissue that is normally affected in the you know disease condition. You prioritize your gene list and look for variations or mutation in the gene and, and with this uh, you know approach by repeating one gene after the other, you will be able to identify possibly the gene that causes the disease condition. So, again you will be looking at some variations and you will be assuming that this is the variation that causes the disease and eventually what you have to do is we have to validate. You have to use some animal models or some other systems to validate that the changes that you have seen indeed you know affect the way the cell functions, tissue functions and organism functions. So, this as you can see is a laborious process. It takes years to identify the defective gene and to characterize using different model systems. So, first let us look into this particular aspect that how do you define the candidate chromosomal region because the rest of them we already discussed. We have discussed how you get the genes from CDN library, we discussed how you do mutation screening, we discussed how you create animal models for a given gene. So, let us look into the first two topics that is define the candidate chromosomal region and then obtain the DNA fragment representing that particular region and then the rest of them you would be able to you know follow. Let us look into the pedigree that is shown on the uh, lower uh, side of the, uh, the lower panel. This is an autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, you can see that affected uh, affected person's parents are not affected and you have consanguinity there is a affected person in the previous generation. Because it is autosomal recessive, we know that the, the, the gene that is defective should be in the autosome, the point that we have already discussed and we have excluded x and y. So, how will you really identify which chromosome and then which part of that particular chromosome possibly has got the defective gene. So, let us look in how we people do. This is what we sort of we are going to look at some puzzle that would try to sort of help you to understand the concept. So, what we are trying to say is that the right. So, what we are going to say is that this particular individual um, who is uh, you know a, a, an individual that are born that is born to the male and female, he has got a mixture of the DNA that he inherited from his father and mother. So, you have 50 percent of your genome is derived from your father and 50 percent of the genome is derived from mother. To represent that we are showing it as a mixture of these two colors, but it is not necessary that these two are exclusive. I mean it is not that chromosome 1 has come from father and chromosome 2 has come from mother. For every chromosome you have two copies, one that has come from father, one that has come from mother. So, this is what we expect right. So, let us look into a puzzle. Uh, this puzzle is uh, you know you have you must have played uh, this kind of puzzles in your, during your childhood days. So, you have uh, identical piece, but they differ in the color. For example, mother's you know puzzle pieces are red in color, father's puzzle pieces are you know blue in color. So, what you are expecting is that there is a mixture of the mother and father you know DNA and that is what you you know in the next generation. How will you this is the concept. So, what we are talking about each puzzle for example, we can say it is a gene and the color represent for example, the um, let us say the dominant allele right for that particular piece for example, this piece here that you are seeing uh, it could be you know a color represent a different allele of a gene let us say that way right. Let us go on to look into. So, how you have you know you can use this information to identify the gene this is a kind of a you know a kind of a um, uh, test uh, how quickly you can identify a puzzle piece and color. Let us see this uh, pedigree and this pedigree obviously represent a dominant disorder because in every generation you find individuals are affected transmitted by either male or female and, uh, and, and both male and female are affected right. So, how do you really find? So, assuming that what is shown here is the genome right and 
all the each one of the piece or the different genes that the genome has you need to identify which piece of this particular puzzle could possibly be carrying the gene that is defective and causing the disease right. So, how do you go about doing it? The correct puzzle piece must be present in every individual affected with the disorder. The correct puzzle piece must be absent in every unaffected individual because you are talking about a dominant disorder and we are assuming here it is 100 percent penetrant. You would expect that if I carry the mutant allele I would definitely show the symptoms the phenotype. So, if I am not showing the phenotype that means I am not carrying the defective gene. So, you know so we have to use this logic to identify which is the puzzle piece. So, this is the genotype that is given the genotype given for each individual that are you know numbered here so, 1, 2, 3 and so on. So, you have father, mother that are identified here and then and then you can look into how the whole thing segregates right. So, if you can spend time and look at this slide probably you will be able to identify which is the puzzle piece. Again you have to go back and look at that the individual who is affected should have all the individuals that are affected in the family must have a particular puzzle piece with particular color that is the gene and the mutation therein because that piece is going to be there in every individual because you all of us have the gene, but only if some of us will have a mutation therefore, we will have the phenotype and all the unaffected individual should not be carrying that particular color of that particular piece right. So, if you look in this and you will be able to identify it. So, I will even I have given the the link for this particular site this is something that I have downloaded from a popular teaching uh, tool that is available on the net. So, this is sort of helps you to understand how you can identify the disease gene. So, if you really go through this link and you spend time you will be able to identify that piece number 36 and color red should be the one that is causing the disease right because this is absent in every individual that is not having the disease and invariably present in individuals that are having the disease this particular piece and red color. So, you can go and verify by looking into this site. So, in that is that is the that is the approach indeed that we use to identify to our you know the disease gene. So, what is the equivalent of that you know the P's and the color in, in, in the human genome these are nothing but repeat loci. So, you have in the your genome a large number of the regions are having um, you know repeat sequences and these repeat sequences you know vary from one individual to other and we use this as the piece as well as the color and that is how we identify the you know disease gene. Let us look at how we use this. See in all our chromosomes we have a large number of repeats as I said. So, these are called as micro satellite repeats they vary in you know size and 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 uh, how um, uh, the variation in the population for example, it could have just a CA repeat repeated many a times. So, for example, it could be 7 times repeated 20 times repeated 8 times repeated varies in the population. It could be GATA, it could be GTC, it could be TA and you can see that from this telomere to that top telomere every chromosome has got you know these repeats spread over the chromosome all right. And this is what we use as a marker to track the segregation across generations. So, you can really say which part of your chromosome has come from you know which grandparents right that means you know your father's father or your father's mother who contributed that small piece although it came through mother. So, we can really really you know look at and then decipher that. How do you do this? something that is shown here. So, you have repeat loss right? we are looking at a particular region particular let us for example, we are looking at that region let us say. So, you have variations in certain individuals you may have an allele which is 10 meaning 10 times repeated C A in some it is 11 some it is 12 it varies you know depending on you may be homozygous or heterozygous you may add the maximum for a given loss you may have two you know alleles. So, if you look into a pedigree that is shown on this side what you see is that this individual is a carrier or uh, carries uh, two alleles for this gene carrying 10 and 11 these are the repeats. So, particular marker you are talking about not the gene 
uh, this marker has got 10 repeat, the other you know homolog has got 11 repeat, this individual has got 12 and 13. Now, you can see in the next generation that you know there is a combination for example, from father 10 has come, from mother 13 has come. Here the other allele father 11 had come, 12 had come from mother, 10 had come from father, 12 had come from mother. So, you can really you know track the segregation of each of the alleles from the parent right. And this is very you know although it is very similar to the mutation that you have seen. So, we have looked at pine mutation and we have looked at how it segregates in the population you know in the, in the family. The difference is for a for a region of a gene where you have a particular base that is mutated at the maximum you may have you know four different alleles that is possible one of the four bases. So, but more often you have only two alleles the wild type and the mutant you do not see many more. But when you are looking at micro satellite markers like what is shown here the CA repeats for example, there may be 20 or 30 or 40 different alleles in the population. So, that makes it much more powerful uh, you know to, to identify which region has come from mother and father. For example, if you have only uh, two uh, alleles like what you see here GG and mother is TG heterozygous and you have GG. Now, you have no ways to tell which G had come from which parent whether it is from father or it is from mother you cannot say likewise for this individual. So, it becomes extremely difficult that is where the micro satellite markers are powerful because you have a large number and the, 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 the probability that you would have you know same allele in both the parents you know is, uh, is less as compared to this kind of uh, you know mutant allele that you see uh, where one base is you know changed with the other. So, how do you really type them how do you see the segregation. So, this is something that I have shown you that you have the repeats the repeats that you see here is a CA repeat what is shown on the top strand this is a complementary strand and you have you call this allele as CA 5 because it has got 5 times repeated. You have another allele that is 7 times repeated. So, how do you really type therefore, I can tell this is the one that had come here. So, how do you do the you know typing we do it by the conventional PCR that is called as uh, polymerase chain reaction routine PCR wherein we design two primers one is forward and the reverse. Now, the primers as you see how come from the flanking sequence you have the repeat here, but this is what you call as a flanking sequence these are identical whether it is 5 repeat or whether it has got 7 repeat the flanking sequence are identical therefore, I can use the same set of primer to amplify any number of alleles it becomes very very easy that is one particular point. So, let us look into how you you know type the allele which allele is the one that you are you know looking at. So, when you do a PCR you will be able to see a difference for each allele the reason being your primers are coming from the you know the flanking sequence unique sequence. So, you can uh, calculate what is the size of your amplified product and then you will be able to you know tell which allele is. For example, the two primers uh, you know that you see the two primers have a definite length that is 9 bases therefore, when you add them it becomes 18 bases. And then you have the repeats the repeats are dinucleated repeats you have two nucleotide unit that is repeating C A C A and so on. So, how many times repeated that would tell you what is the length for example, if you have 5 repeat then it will going to be 10. So, plus if you add 10 plus 18 which is this sequence of the primer now you are going to for the 5 allele it is going to be 28 bases for 7 allele for example, it is going to be 32 bases by looking at the size difference in a gel and, and calculating what is the size of that particular fragment you will be able to tell what is the allele that you are looking at. So, this is the approach people use and when you obviously, when you run these products in a gel you are going to find you know distinct fragment DNA fragments you can you know expect the size and then calculate. So, here is a here is a pedigree which uh, which shows autosomal dominant uh, disorder you can see that individuals in every generation is affected. And what you have done is we have looked at a marker a marker uh, by PCR and what is shown here is the how it migrated in a gel. So, each of the number that you are showing either below an individual or in the gel represent the particular allele 25 is an allele 22 is an allele and so on so forth. So, you are looking at an autosomal marker therefore, uh, individual would be having two copies that is what you are seeing here 
this individual you know the, the in the first generation is having 22 and 25 as you can see here and she has got 27 and 35 again that is shown here and likewise you show for every individual what is the you know the genotype that you see. So, basically you look at the gel and then you derive what is the allele that is got. Now, you can clearly map it for example, this 35 has come from this individual and this 22 has come from this individual and so on you can map. Now, how does it really help you to identify the gene? So, you can see there are certain you know um, allele markers now, now that are highlighted and these are the markers that are invariably present in the affected individual. If you can go back and connect with the puzzle that you have seen. So, we have looked at a piece and we have looked at a color. So, what you looked at that particular piece having a particular color should invariably present in the affected that means, that is the piece that possibly likely to have the defective gene. So, that is exactly the same thing we are doing, we have used markers and you are looking at which allele of a given marker invariably present in the affected and whether it is invariably absent in the unaffected assuming 100 percent penetrance. You can see here this 35 marker is present in all the affected individuals and it is not present in any other unaffected individual suggesting this marker could possibly present close to a gene which is defective because this marker itself is not causing the disease because these are repeats which are not part of any genome any gene. So, they are present randomly and they may not have any functional significance that is why you see a large number of variation in the population, but they may be present close to your gene that is what shown here. For example, this is the marker that let us say that has got number 35 right the allele that that causes the disease and close to this marker you know in the chromosome very nearby you have a gene that causes a disease which you call as HD here and because they are present close to each other now they are going to go together they will not be separated by a, a recombination they will not be separated by a recombination. Therefore, whenever you see that individual is affected you will have that marker like you can see affected and the marker is present. In those individuals who are not affected this particular allele of a given marker is not present. So, that is what you do you basically look at a given marker an allele of it that is co segregating that is present in all the affected and not present in the unaffected if the penetrance that you are talking about is 100 percent. So, this is the way you go about and identify a small chromosomal region that could possibly be contributing to the disease. So, how do you really calculate because you are going to look at thousands of markers to begin with because you are looking at all the chromosomes when you talk about autosome you are having 22 chromosomes each chromosome you may have 100 markers you are going to look into a large number of markers. So, you need you know uh, uh, here we are doing it with a some statistics and then try to sort of guess whether this is the region that could possibly harbor the gene. So, that is called as the likelihood the possibility. So, the likelihood that a marker will be inherited together with the affected gene is measured as a log of odds ratio. So, this is the statistical approach people use that you find a marker co segregating with a phenotype because it is present in close proximity to a gene that is defective is not happening by chance it is not random you know probability right. It happens likely because it is linked closely linked to that particular you know affected you know gene. So, that is what you calculate by using a you know a statistical method and that is what depicted as lot score LOD that normally they call. So, if the lot score is higher then it is likely that the gene is present very close to that marker if the lot score is very low for a particular marker in your analysis then it is not likely that a gene is present close to that you know region. So, this is how you come up with for example, what is shown here is there are each uh, square here is a marker that was tested for the so called linkage analysis that is what is shown here that you have done a pedigree and done the genotyping for all the individuals in that pedigree and then you are calculating the lot score and you find that a, a small region of the chromosome you have all the markers showing very high lot score like that what you see here. That suggests likely that 
a gene is present somewhere in this particular region, say for example, it is present here. So, from all the 22 chromosomes, you have come to a small region of a particular chromosome by and looking at markers, they themselves are not genes, but because they are present somewhere close to a gene that is defective, they would co-segregate with a particular phenotype, right. So, that is how we are able to narrow down the gene. So, that is how you narrow down a region which you know possibly could have the gene. So, you know let us see how from that segment, that small segment that you identified by this linkage analysis, how do you now go and find the gene. So, what is the second step? The second step is that the region that you identified narrowed down what you call here, you need to look at large number of markers in that. So, that is what the next step. Now, you do not really worry about the rest of the chromosomes or even the rest of the regions of this particular chromosome. So, you you know this segment you go and look at large number of markers. If markers not available, you generate markers and then look at again analysis. You know you do this you know genotyping and then you narrow down further. We will talk about how do you narrow down and then finally, you know you once you have done that this is the smallest region that I can define, then you go about looking at what are the genes that are present there. Say suppose you found only one gene, then go about checking for mutations in the gene and if that is having a mutation, then you have found the gene. So, this is the step that you go about doing it. That is what is shown here in this cartoon as well. So, you start with just a recap because we are getting into uh, a, a problem that you I would help you to solve and later we may have some assignments given on that. But what we have done is that we have used the pedigree approach to identify whether it is autosomal or sex linked or X or Y or dominant recessive. Then you have done the genetic mapping, you have used large number of markers and then you are able to say uh, this region of the chromosome possibly the gene is located. And then you go about characterizing that region of the chromosome to find the genes right what is shown here. And then look at whether a given gene is having a mutation something like what you are seeing. So, you, in a patient if there is a mutation resulting in stop codon, then you know that you have gotten the gene that you are looking for. So, in this process what you have done is you really did not bother about what is the gene, what is the function, whether it is expressed, what kind of protein it codes, you did not bother it about all. You looked at what is the chromosome that is linked to the disease, what are the genes that are present and then whether any of the gene carries any mutation that could be causing the disease. So, this is a you know an approach based on the position of the gene therefore, it is called as positional cloning because more often this led to the discovery of a new gene more often that is the case. And therefore, it is called as cloning because you identified a new gene. So, that is why it is called as positional cloning. So, let us see you know in this in this particular slide what I am saying is that if you have identified and narrowed down a small segment of chromosome, you need to look at that genomic region. So, now you have to carefully look at that genomic region, what are the genes that are present there, right. For that, you need to go to the library what you call as genomic library and get fragments that represent that region of the chromosome, arrange them and then you know characterize that region as to what are the genes that are present. How do you really do this? this process is called as physical mapping. What you do in this case is that for example, this is the region you narrow down you have markers and then you go and use this marker to screen the genomic library. And then once you screen the genomic library, you would get a DNA fragment from a library that represent you know somewhere here you know a fragment of that particular chromosome. Now, you use this genomic DNA fragment that you got from the library to get the clones you know different fragments that overlap with each other and representing the region which could possibly harbor the gene. So, you have to you know you have to take pieces of the DNA that are there in, in your genomic library, stitch them together to get the DNA representing that region of the chromosome. So, this is called as physical mapping, sometimes it is called as chromosome walking because it is a very slow process. You get one, one step, get the other clone that is the second step and then third clone that is third step. So, you slowly move on either side to get all the clones that represent that region. The question is why should you do this? Because when you do this kind of exercise, 
you would have a fragment that representing part of the chromosome and that results in, in the identification of another piece both of which may share some region that is the way you are able to say this follows this. So, the, this overlap is very very critical if you can recall our discussion on how do you create genomic library we said that we do either a partial digestion wherein all the sites are not cut or we use two different you know enzymes to create fragments that overlap with each other that is the way you will be able to connect one with the other that is how they are done earlier. So, in each you know junction you can find there are small segments that overlap with each other and you are able to create what is called as you know overlapping clones which in color in, 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 in a term in genomics called as quantic. So, how do you really you know use this quantic? So, what is the purpose of the quantic? One of the reason is that the microsatellite markers people used then to um, screen for chromosomal regions. We know that these markers are coming from this region of the chromosome, but the exact physical order, order of these markers were not known. The reason being the approach that they used for localizing a given marker is very different because then you do not you know that time even the fragments were not identified like the way now we are talking about that there is a physical you know mapping or chromosome walking. And only in this process you will be able to arrange the markers in the physical order. We know that the markers are present here, but exact order of the markers are not very very clear and they are very very essential for mapping studies like we are going to see now. How do you really arrange the markers? So, basically what you do is, so you have markers which are nothing but you know region of the chromosome that you can amplify by PCR. So, once you have got for example, clones genomic clones either from yeast artificial chromosome or bacterial artificial chromosome or land of phage library these are the fragments. Now, what you do is you each DNA fragment you isolate and then do a PCR and test whether a given marker you know is located on this piece. If it amplifies that segment that means it is present there, if it does not amplify that marker is not present. So, as you can see here. Um, um, you have uh, you know different uh, primer pairs like for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on. And what you have done for each primer pair you have used the DNA either from the clone A, B or C and then you have seen that for some there is a product, for some there is no product. Based on this information you are able to place it for example, you know PCR primer 1 you know that amplified only from this particular clone that is clone A that means it is located only in clone A not in any other. On the other hand some of them are you know some of the fragments some of the PCR uh, products where you are able to amplify from more than one. So, this information helps you to say the 5 and 3 probably are present in a region that overlap between A and C. Likewise primer 4 you know is located in a region that overlaps between C and B whereas, 2 is unique to B, 6 is unique to B and likewise 1 is unique to B. So, this is how you are able to position you know the relative order still you are unable to solve this 5 and 3 which is the order, but you have had some other clone probably will be able to still you know place them. So, this is how you position them and once you are done you are going to look at something like this which is called as a quantic map. So, all that are shown on the top are markers and each of this line that you see here are the different clones of for example, bacterial artificial chromosome. You can see that these markers are present and these markers are present and so on and you are able to position this is the order of the marker right. It starts from 11 ends at 30 and so on. So, this is what called as quantic. So, in to just to summarize what we have discussed you have looked at a region that you have mapped onto a chromosome likely to have a gene and you want to identify the gene. How do you go about doing it? So, you have done what is called as genomic library screening identified several overlapping you know contacts clones and you have tested the markers that you have used for the physical order. So, what you have done you have done PCR using each one of the you know clones that you got and you are able to using this information you are able to say this is the order of all the markers this is the correct order. So, 
you know all the markers are located within this segment, but you are not sure about the order, now you are able to get the order, right? This is a physical order. So, how this particular physical order helps you to identify the gene? This is a real life situation, this uh, you know uh, pedigree that is uh, from one of the papers, publications describing a autosomal dominant disorder, right? You can see here there are three markers, you can see the D22S and 117, these three are the markers and whatever number that you see here or the allele numbers. For example, this is number 1, this is 2 and this is 3 and this is the 3 markers in every individual it is done typed. And what you can see here is that there is a, a particular order of the markers. For example, you have an individual here who is affected and this individual has got 2, 1, 3, you know 2 allele for the first marker one allele for the second marker, three allele for the third marker and this combination 2, 1, 3 because these are in the physical order that is also represented by you know the black bar there is invariably present in every individual that are affected, right. So, that is you know what you are able to get by now you are, you are able to clearly look at a combination of alleles that are located to each other what you call as haplotype, you know the physical order of certain alleles as a block not separated by a recombination is called as a haplotype. And this haplotype you can see that that goes from this generation to this generation and likewise you know from this generation to here and from here to here and so on. So, this you are able to track. Suppose your order was not accurate, you do not know the order you may miss out this particular information. There were markers somewhere in between these two, you would assume this is not the haplotype. So, for you to identify a haplotype, the physical order is extremely important. Therefore, it is not simply the information as to where is this allele or marker is located, but the physical order of the markers are very, very important in successfully identifying the regions that could have the disease, right. Now, let us see how the haplotype helps us to identify the gene. This is a schematic again to show how do you use these markers to identify the disease gene. Now, we are using a autosomal recessive condition, you have a male, a female and we have shown each box here represent the different alleles right of you know a given marker and here is a gene, this is the gene that you are seeing in between and here is an individual who is heterozygous having a muted allele and she marries a normal individual and she is a carrier and then they have got two sons they marry you know of course. And then in the next generation his you know the, this particular parents um, grandson and granddaughter they marry together right which is common happens in many societies. And as a result this individual who was a carrier for the disease uh, linked allele mutation. Now, she is able to give this allele to both her son and daughter who are retrozygotes asymptomatic normal, but now when there is a marriage between you know uh, between these two individuals what what you see is that you know these two alleles could come together in the next generation and when it happens you become you know a homozygous for the mutation therefore, you develop symptoms. Now, you can identify this region because it remains homozygous by looking at the markers that are flanking here. You see that these are like the puzzle piece, we have given a different color, the allele green is one allele, the blue is another allele, red is another allele. And you can see that in every generation there are at times there are recombination, but you can see around the gene you invariably have the green allele, meaning they are not separated by you know the recombination. So, if you are able to look at the allele which allele you know segregates in this phenotype in this in this family and whether there is a homozygosity for a given allele invariably every affected is homozygous for that particular allele that would give you a clue that a gene could be located here and that is what called as homozygosity mapping when you look at recessive disorders because it is normally as you shown here it is the same defective allele when it comes in the homozygous condition you end up having the disease because most most often these are consanguineous marriages, marriages within related and, 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 and that is the result you see here. And that is again shown here 
with a real life situation for one of the disorders. Let us not worry about what disease it is. These are the markers right and then what we are showing is that there is a homozygous region. This is a large family you can see there are four affected and there are consanguinity recessive disease and you see a region that is shown with a box and you will find homozygosity right. These are affected and is 1 1 2 2 1 1 2 2 1 1 again see homozygosity 2 2 1 1. So, you can see that 2 1 1 is present invariably in homozygous condition that means your gene should be located somewhere within this segment. So, this is how you arrive at the gene. So, that is what you call as homozygous mapping. So, we are we are going to look at one such problem. So, I help you with you know solving this puzzle and then we may give a couple of examples for you to work out on your own. So, let us find a disease we name it as x y disease nothing to do with x and y chromosome some name and this is the family. It is clear from here that is a recessive disease because you have an affected you have consanguinity affected parents are not affected and of course, there are relatives who are affected here right. And we already done the whole genome large number of markers and we are able to you know, narrow down a region of a chromosome which has got you know, a gene for this particular disease right. What we need to do? We need to narrow down the region, we need to identify more markers you know make them in physical order and look at the homozygosity as to because this is a recessive disease that is what you are going to do. So, these are the markers right, the markers are A, G, S, E and H right, some names that, that you need not really worry about right now and these are the markers. And what you do? You are done genotyping for every marker you have done a PCR and you are able to identify the alleles and that is what shown here. You can see that quickly there is no you know large extended homozygous anything. This is the kind of you know thing that you see that that you are you are getting the alleles from both the generations going to the next generation and so on. So, what you need to do is that you need to identify the correct physical order of these markers. So, what do you do? You have to go for the genomic library and then identify clones that represent this region of the chromosome and do PCR for each of the clones and then identify the order right. So, what you have done that is what you have done. So, you have done that you have. So, these are the markers A, G, S, E and H and you have done a screening in the genomic library you are able to get 5 clones say these are bacterial artificial chromosomes. So, therefore, you call it the BACs. B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. Here when you say minus that means the PCR did not work meaning that marker is not present in this clone whereas, S marker and E marker and H marker are present in B5. So, that is the indication. So, plus amplified in PCR did not amplify right. So, this is what you use right. Now, this is the information that you have. Now, based on this you have to arrange the order of this particular um, you know the set of uh, markers how do you do it. So, let us say I am going to put is that I am going to say this is B 1 clone. The B 1 clone is positive for as you can see here that it is positive for marker A, G and N. B 2 is positive for A and N therefore, I would assume you know the G is away from A, it is not in between A and N therefore, it is away from it. So, let us let me let me say that let me say that A and N are close to each other. So, I would you know put a line and you would say that here it is this is A and this is N. Let us look into B 2, B 2 is again positive for A and N and I would say this is B 2. Now, let us look into A again. So, uh, sorry let us look into the B 1, B 1 is also positive for G and no other marker has got that G marker right. So, then I would put it on the extreme left because they are not present in any other. So, I would say this is present here. Let us go to B 3, B 3 is positive for E and N. 
So, n is already there I would say e is here and then b 4 that is positive for s and e. So, e is here therefore, s should be here and that is like this, this is b, this is b 3, this is b 4 and then you have b 5 which has got s, e and h. So, what is missing h? it has got everything. So, when you order you are able to get an order which also conveys some meaning for example, it is my name. So, it is jumbled up when you order it, it gives you thing. So, that sort of tells you what is the physical order of these markers. Now, why should I do this? How does it really help me? That is what you are going to see. So, uh, you know by, by doing all these things I am able to make a quantic which clearly tells me that this is the order of the marker that is G A N E S H right that is the quantic right we made it. Now, how does it really help me? So, this is what the genotyping data that I had for every marker I have done the amplification this is what it is. Now, this was before the haplotype was before the physical ordering was done. Now, we know that this is not the correct order we have changed it right. So, now what I have done I have rearranged everything based on this particular marker right. Now, what you need to look at because the recessive disease you have to carefully look at the homozygous region. So, if you look into these two individuals that are affected and you will find markers A, N and E you know they remained in homozygous condition you see that 4, 4, 5, 5, 4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, 4, 4 and you do not find that homozygosity in any of the affected individuals uh, sorry unaffected individuals. So, that suggests that this is a region likely you know having the disease causing the you know disorder. This is the region that is likely to have the gene that causes the disorder and if you look in here you know when you have not done the homozygosity mapping when you have not done the you know correct ordering of the markers you know they are not really explaining what is the real scenario which region is showing the homozygous that is why the physical ordering is very very important. Now, how did it really help you this is a quantic region you know, homozygous region that you have seen that is A N E A this is a region that remained homozygous. How does it really help you in identifying the gene the way it helps us is by screening for genes you know you now you need to look into what are the genes that are located here right. So, I know there are three genes G 1, G 2 and G 3 these are the three genes. What did I do? I did screening for you know each of the gene whether it is this gene is located on B 1 or B 2 or B 3, B 4, B 5 and likewise it is amplified here, amplified here this particular gene amplified in two different backs. Now, we are used this information to locate again the gene back on the contact and that is what you see here G 1 amplified only in B 1 that means, it is present in a region that are not shared by any other backs. Likewise, G 2 is located only in B 5 therefore, their position is a region that is not shared by any other back clone whereas, G 3 amplified by both B 2 and B 3, but not by any other clone and this is the back and you know this is the only region you know which is not present in other backs therefore, that is where the G 3 is and likely because that is also the region where you have homozygosity and therefore, you will be able to confidently tell and this is likely the gene that could cause the disease and is involved in the disease that you are looking at and now you go on sequence if you are lucky you can find mutations in the affected and that is how you identify the disease gene. So, that you know pretty much you know ends the first lecture of week 4 and wherein we have looked at the approach people use uh, to identify the disease gene in monogenic disorders. We have looked at how markers help us, how you use markers to identify the haplotype, how do you narrow down for example, in case of recessive disease for homozygous region and then locate a gene and then identify a novel gene which may cause a particular disease. So, this is the approach people take to identify the disease gene and with that we will end the first lecture and in the next lectures we are going to look into the other aspects like how 
uh, the other approach, what are the other approaches because of the post genomic era, meaning you are you now know the human genome sequence, how that has changed the approach, it has become much more easier now. So, that is something that we are going to look into in the next lecture.